You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we're heading back to the Fredericksburg area of Virginia. Really a hidden gem, just that whole area. We know about Richmond. We know about the James River. You go further south, Norfolk. There's a ton of lakes down there, electric motor only. Kerr on the south. You got Smith to the north. But then at, in Fredericksburg, you have the Rappahannock River. You have so many nice size electric motor only lakes. And the only person that I could think of to have on is Shane Flynn Outdoors. Shane, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the thanks for the invite, for sure. You've you've been on the channel a couple of times, but for people that don't know, uh you started your YouTube channel uh, I think a year before mine or right around there. And you have an interesting past because you did you start out wanting to be a YouTuber? Did you have another career before you became a big sensation online? <laughs> well yeah I'm re- well first I'm retired from the military. I, I started my YouTube channel about three years ago, three years and two months ago. And I, I was not big into YouTube. My buddy just mentioned it to me because I just built my boat and he goes, why don't you just record your fishing? So I stepped into it and uh, just like any other YouTuber, not knowing about how to build content that first year, I kind of struggled, but um, you know, built, just kept, you know, filming my catches and stuff like that. But then I jumped into a niche um, that's kind of uh, really skyrocketed my channel. And that's, uh, uh, online bass fishing tournaments. So that's really, I hold six tournaments a year across the United States with different types of rules. And um, that's really caught on, became very, very popular. And it's helped propel my channel along with, along with building better content or developing better content, as you, as you know, as a YouTuber, um, you get better as time goes, but mm-hmm. combined with the uh, online tournaments that we do, it's, uh, it's really helped me jump from, you know, just a measly little tiny channel to now I'd say a small channel you know, you know, around 10,000 subscribers, but it's, it's been exciting. I did not expect it to be this way. No, not at all. How did you figure that? Like, how did that niche fall into your lap? Did you, did, was that an aha moment that you had? Well, honestly, I've seen another YouTube YouTuber try to do it. And I just looked at it. I was like, well, if you, in, if you go with length only and you use a bump board and you give everybody a special code, I think it would work. So I just on a niche, took my own money and sponsored the tournament, you know, with the $200 first prize, $100 second prize. So, you know, 350 bucks of my own money for prizes and it's caught on. And what everybody's worried about now in tournament fishing, since we cut the cheaters, you know, in the walleye tournament is how do you keep it fair and ensure there's no cheating? And I have not had an issue one when you lay a fish on a bump board and you got to take a picture of it for length to turn in kind of eliminates any type of cheating in the code. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the code on the picture, it doesn't count. So um, that unique code to each angler helps out. And uh, it's just, I mean, I, like I said, just experimented. It caught on from about 50 people the first time. The next year, a couple hundred. And like I was, uh, was talking earlier, this summer tournament, we have 717 people across the United States in, the, in, in our online tournament. So. That's crazy. Yeah. When it talks about cheating and we're having a whole generation of anglers that are growing up specifically with the catch photo release format. MLF has tried this, but they have the money, the budget for the elite set for the elite anglers to do this. Will they ever have a way to incorporate weight into this eventually to make it yeah. more streamlined for lack of a better word? Yeah, there's actually technology out there. And part of me um, being a little bit of an entrepreneur is starting to look into uh, investing in this. So they have Bluetooth scales that you can link to your to your smartphone and link it to an app and you can catch film and, and it will or, you know catch and take a picture and get your scale weight right then on your Bluetooth phone and registered online. And then you can release the fish. Right? That's cool. Yeah, I, we're you know technology's there. Part of this, and honestly, I talked to, I'm in some other bass clubs down south with my friends and like, we're never doing it. We want to come back to the, to the boat ramp and show off our fish. It's like, okay, you know, you, eat, to each their own. But I mean, there is a little bit of fish kill. You know that we talked about that before, 
why do we run around with fish in a live well all day when we got the technology available? We haven't perfected it, but somebody's got to step out and uh, get into that track where we can catch film and weigh release. Because, yeah, the people, even in these length only tournaments, I had a guy catch an eight pound, four ounce bass and a seven pound, three ounce bass won the tournament because it was longer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people that that's a little bit of the turn off with the length only, but there's a way there's a way to do it. The technology is there. Someone just has to step out and be bold, I think. And it's hard because it's a cultural thing. You've been dealing with weight for so long. And, you know, to be fair, it's like, yeah, like uh, you can have a heavier fish that is shorter, like you just mentioned there. Uh, there was one person on some show that, that I listened to about putting a scale onto the bump board. So when you take a picture, it is a scale itself that you lay him down so you get both. And and like in what you did, there's there are concepts out there that I think once they get into the forefront, into the zeitgeist, because already Bubba Scales is selling. I mean, this is spoilers here. Bubba Scales will probably sell their data at some point because that's probably yeah. how they do that. So it's there. It's in the zeitgeist. And I think once that happens, that's going to be the big turn where I don't know what will happen with weight tournaments because again, if you had to put your stock into something, that is the future. We're heading that way. It's just when we right. get there. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, the one thing I hate to see, and, and I don't blame anybody for this because this is how tournaments have came along. I went to Mooney the other day after a tournament and the three largest fish that got released were dead right by the boat ramp. I hate mm. to see that. And it's not anybody's fault, right? I mean, we're fishing in the middle of summer they try to keep them alive, but uh, if I can say, if we can save some of those bigger fish for someone else to catch, um, I'm all for it. Now, I realize there's going to be kill off. I mean, we probably lose fish that we don't know about that we hook, right? But the more ratio of the larger fish that we can save, I think is a better thing. So I'm not, I'm not, think, I'm not like I said, not, uh, you know, blaming anybody for it. It's just the nature of the game right now with the, with the weight tournaments, bringing them back and letting them lose. You're going to have some loss. And unfortunately, on that tournament, it was the three largest fish. Especially yeah. with, with the lakes down your way, because they're not, you know, Bugs Island size, you know, 50,000 acre right. reservoirs that you're dealing with. Right. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about those lakes, I think you had something really amazing happen this past spring. Uh, there's a YouTube video. I will link it in the episode description if you want to go check that bad boy out. Was that the best day you've ever had on the water? Um, yeah, I'd have to say it's the best day I've had on the water. Um, you know, in the YouTube video, it's a 30 pound bag, but in reality, uh, I didn't get to film one of the fish that I caught because it just did not come up because of the rain. I couldn't make, you couldn't make it out. Um, but it was a 35 pound day. Um, mm. and that been the best day I've had, especially in Virginia that I can remember had some good days, but not a 35 pound day. And honestly, I caught all those fish in about an hour and 45 minutes. It was just, they were hammering it. So, um, in that lake, um, which you fished with me hunting run, um, it's got some big fish in it, but I'll tell you this time of year, it's tough. Um, you don't see a lot of bigs coming out, uh, this time of year, unless you know how to get down and catch them in that 20 to 25 foot range. And then it's still really tough to get them. So. But between all the lakes down in that area, you have Mooney, Hunting Run, like Nye, Mott's, Abel. I mean, I'm probably missing a lake or two that's in there. Sure. Do they all fish basically the same? Are they basically set up the same when it comes to cover? Or, or do some lakes have grass in it, some lakes like Hunting Run that don't really have a lot of vegetation? Like, how do they play out? I'm sorry, sweetie. I'm on the phone. My granddaughter walked in. I'm sorry. Oh, oh you're fine. <laughs> Um, so every, every one of these lakes down here are very different. Um, you know, hunting run doesn't have a lot of grass in it and it doesn't have a lot of cover. Um, and then you go 10 miles as a crow flies five miles up to, to, uh, Mooney loaded with cover and loaded with moss. I mean, it's just heavy moss yesterday or Sunday afternoon. I was catching them, the moss lines down to 17 feet. Um, it's wow. really, because the water's so clear too. You can see ten foot deep in Mooney right now. Uh -huh. So they they definitely fish different. Abel is a real steep bank lake, um, and you know one of the lakes that's starting to get a lot of uh, fishing on is Lunga. That's on the Marine Corps base. A lot of people are liking that lake, but that lake has very little features. Hmm. It doesn't have much moss. The it's it's actually kind of tough to fish, um, especially if you're just thinking you're going to pound the bank um it's just it's just a kind of a bowl lake um, so all the lakes have different features they fish different down here um and that's what makes it exciting you know within in my within my 
15 miles of my house, I have seven different reservoirs that fish seven different ways. So, And Lunga, just for people that are aware, is there a special ruling? Like, it, can anybody just waltz onto the marine base or is it basically you need a license, a permit, or, or how does that all work? Yeah, so if you want to fish Lunga, you do have to go to the Marine Base, uh, the Marine Corps Base, to the uh, MWR, the recreation. You just ask to go in the gate. You go in there, you got to buy a, a tag for um, a Quantico. And then you have to have a Quantico license. Um, anybody can register to do it, as long as you're not a felon or anything like that. But it's open to everybody. You just have to pay the uh, for the uh, the Quantico license and the fee, the pass uh, for an, an annual pass, which I think is forty dollars. And there's two good lakes, pretty good size lakes, Smith Lake and Lunga Lake, within hmm. three miles of each other. Hmm. And I, you know the. Yeah, the, you know, the story of Lunga is it was closed for 15 years and no fishing because there was unexploded ordnance on it. And last summer they opened it up after 15 years. And of course, everybody thought we were going to go out and catch a giant every time you, you, you throw a lure, but it didn't work out that way. Isn't that crazy, though, how some lakes do that? Like, okay, that lake didn't have a, a sniff of fishing pressure for a long time. But then you look at Mooney and Hunting Run, who have been pounded pretty heavily and the fish you what you pulled out sb fishing pulled out like an eight or nine pounder out of mooney in in april it's that's insane how that all kind of falls down in the wash yeah it so uh, you know mooney's a good a great example of a lake that has phenomenal forge um when you go out now if you if you don't see at least a bait ball every five minutes of shad or every some type of bait fish something's wrong i mean the, mm. the forage is unbelievable um and that really goes to the quality of the bass uh in that lake you know sunday afternoon i fished for three hours and 22 minutes i caught 12 bass eight of the 12 bass were over four pounds wow that's i mean that's a testament to the quality of the fish and the forage is in there to feed them is it's phenomenal and i really do think we're going to see 10 pounders come out of there in the next uh year to two years um kind of more regularly you know we get seven and eights out of there now but i i see um that 10 pound mark uh starting to show up in in mooney here pretty soon is it thread fin is it gizzard shad what what is the bait balls made out it, of it, it's thread fin um and then i can't i haven't been able to pick out exactly what the other bait fish is um i just haven't got a hold of one but there is some thread fin in there there's some other type of bait fish that i mean it's heavy I mean, I'll just see schools that light up my live scope for like a 30 yard swath. It's wow. unbelievable. Yeah. It's really unbelievable. So that's, that's going to drive that lake to, to produce some big fish. Uh, and uh, honestly, Thomas, I, it does get fished, but I don't think it gets fished that hard because hmm. it is a tough lake to, to come out and fish on. Um, you know, also on Sunday when I was out there, a kayaker came down from Maryland, first time on the lake, struggled all day and asked me where they're at. I said, about 15 to 17 feet. He caught a seven pounder about 15 minutes later after I told him where to get it from. But he had struggled all day, right? Because if you can't figure out the lake, it's a hard lake to figure out. Um, but a lot of people come down and go, there ain't no fish in that lake. And, and you know, if you go to pound the banks all day, you might feel that way. You got to get out and fish the structure and, and especially in the summertime. Do any of them stick to the grass or do they pretty much predominantly just chase bait in the summertime? Uh, if they're chasing bait, you're not catching them. <laughs> I can tell mm. you that. You get in those big, uh, I'll be in those big schools of shad and I'll throw everything in the, in the tackle box and they just won't bite. You're competing with those shad, right? You've probably yeah. heard that before. Um, when I, the fish that I catch are down deep on those edge weed lines or they're on some type of hard cover. Um, they really, that's where you'll, you'll catch them at every once in a while. You'll get one on a, you, you might run a, uh, something through there real fast in the bait ball and catch something like a rattle trap or something, but it, it's rare. So. Uh, one of our, one of our mutual friends, uh, Marty Lawson, he dubbed this other lake, uh, no fish nigh. And a lot of people say that about that lake. Why does that lake get that rap? Is it a fish kill that happened or something like that? I don't know if there is a fish kill there. I've never, I, I've heard that a hundred times. I have never went to that lake and not caught a good stringer fish. Hmm. It's a good quality lake. Um, unfortunately, I've never filmed an episode on it, but I've, I've caught 
four or five, four or five pounders pretty regularly when I went there. And it, I was told it was hard to learn the lake. It didn't take me very long. It's, it's a little bit bigger than hunting run. And it's only three miles from five miles from hunting run, but it's a guy, it's a stained lake. There's color in the water versus the clear water that you see at hunting run. So it might be part of it. Um, you just got to adapt, but I think it's a pretty good lake. And the Fredericksburg uh, electric boat uh, uh, tournament trail down here, they fish it regularly. And I think they average just looking at their website, they average an 18 pound bag to win it. That's so crazy. That's, yeah, that's pretty good. That's interesting. It's so interesting how a rumor can become yeah. fact. And and when I've heard this not just from from Marty, but other people, like yeah, like that's a that's that like is dead compared to the other two. And to hear you say, no, it's actually pretty good. It's interesting how much of that is people just hear the rumor, and it it diminishes the fishing pressure. I think what's so unique about Fredericksburg, and I've said this a couple of times, as the case study is. If you can have a couple of lakes in an area versus one big one, it diminishes fishing pressure because you you have to pick a lake and it does right. spread the anglers out. Yes, absolutely. Um, and there's another lake right there close that most people don't fish. And again, a rumor that it's got fished out is Mott's Run. Um, and then this this spring they held a tournament there and a nine pounder was caught out of it. So it's just you know again you what people tell you and, and that and that lake is a pretty nice lake as well so um but when you have a, when you have as many lakes as we have here it does spring spread out the angling pressure uh, for sure and they're all electric right so you can only mm -hmm. you have to pick us most folks have to pick an area of the lake they want to concentrate on especially if they're just running a regular trolling motor on the back of their boat um so it keeps you from running all over the lake uh you know and in, like you would in a standard bass boat, right? Because the lake, the lakes are smaller, but you know, seven hundred acre lake is pretty big when you only got you only go six miles per hour. Oh yeah, I mean that's the problem with the uh, the res. Uh, I mean, I fished two events out of a ranger, then I hopped in a friend's boat who has a nine a nine nine, but it's almost a twenty five three thousand acre lake for a nine nine. It's like borderline insanity to try to run that thing. Um, yeah, it's almost too big. And then you look at like Mooney, I mean, and it's also like how a lake is like laid out. Like Mooney has so many coves and pockets. It feels bigger than it is. I believe, oh, yeah. you know, this off probably more than me, like 800 acres, 600 acres, right around there, yeah. maybe nine. It's 790, if I'm not mistaken. 790. Right? It feels bigger than that when you get there too. Sure. It's really weird. Yeah, it's the way it's laid out. It's got three fingers that are, they're really long. So it's kind of spread out and it, it it, and the other side of that, it's really, really deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a water reservoir, right, for the water treatment plant. So it's got areas in it's 120 feet deep, you know, which is which is deep for a water reservoir. So, but it it, it is spread out, and it's got a lot of good cover um, in it. That it's just it's just a great lake to fish. But when it's tough, just like any other lake, it can be tough to catch fish in it. It, 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 is is Mott's Run and, and Nye also water treatment facilities? Like, what is their purpose? Is it just recreation? Uh, Mott's was just for recreation. It was uh, built, in, I think, in the 50s for recreation. But uh, Nye was a water reservoir as well. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And then Hunting Run is also water? Or is that recreation? It's it's water. Oh, that's a lot of water. Wow. That's in a short yeah. area, too. Yeah. Huh. And Abel Lake was actually the original um water uh, water treatment plant was for the stafford area was able lake so do they just pump water from the rappahannock into the lakes is that what they do or the rapidan yeah so that's what they do on mooney is they pump if you look at a map um the dam is probably about a half mile from the rappahannock and they have a big pool uh dug out in the rappahannock and they have a pump that they suck the water up into mooney uh like a uh, mooney reservoir and when that when it's pumping and you, there's a video on my channel that says don't ever go by this secret spot which is not a secret anymore when they're pumping water in it comes out in one area in the lake and the bass just stack up there you can catch them all day long is that random or is it like a tva where there's like a schedule that they pump there is no schedule it's random they don't advertise it if you hear the, if you're driving through that part of the lake and you stop and you hear that water running go fish <laughs> go there and fish that's really cool dude yeah I, you live in absolutely a, a wonderful area. Um, w have you branched out down off of the Fredericksburg area at all? Is there any lakes outside of that area that you have uh, dabbled in with your electric motor boat that you can talk about? 
I have not branched too far out. I do want to get down to the Richmond area. Um, and there's some really good lakes down there. And, and uh, I plan on doing that probably next year. My goal this year is to do a little river fishing in the fall. So I want to <laughs> branch into the rivers um, a little bit. Um, that's kind of my yearly goal for this year is to get into some river fishing. Um, and then next year I want to get down into the, into the Richmond area and fish some of those good lakes down there. I hear lots of good stuff about those lakes. Now, I think you said we're allowed to talk about this on the show, but uh, is that going to be next year with that new uh, new toy that you're going to be in? Yeah. So um, I just purchased a new uh, hull. I say a hull because it's, uh, it's just a uh, 18-foot, 60-inch wide, um, well-built boat. And I'm going to have Trick Tins. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of cash at him and say, make it make it awesome. So the so boat, cool. I've already named the boat. The boat's going to be called the Shockwave. So, That's awesome. Um, yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some. I'm gonna put some serious coin in it because this is the last boat that I'm gonna buy. Probably, I I was gonna buy a big giant bass boat, but why do it in this area? I'm limited mm-hmm. on where I can fish, um, so I'm gonna put a lot of money into this boat. Put a 20 horsepower electric on the back of it. Uh, put the new force uh, Garmin Kraken unit on the front trolling motor. I got matter of fact, I just bought a new 12 inch screen. I'm not putting in my old boat. I'm putting all this this new live scope that's going in the new boat. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to really, uh, pimp that boat out. I'm, you know, going to get a little bit heavier into the tournament fishing that next year. I think this regional thing tournament wise is so interesting. I had on, well, by the time this episode airs, that one would have aired Jake Harshman, who runs the mid Atlantic kayak association. I've had Mike that runs NVKBA. They're big time regional kayak organizations that pay out like thousands of dollars for a winner where you could do a national tour, but you have to travel to Toledo Bend. You have to travel to Florida and the cost. And I know you've gone to like Lake you follow before, like that stuff in 2024 adds up. Yep. I feel like these regional circuits are gonna get even better. Like I think that's what's next is if you can go fish a regional tour like yours or, or, or someone else's, wouldn't you rather do that versus having to drive all over God's earth and then have most of your winnings get eaten up with expenses? Yeah. I So one of the things I've been thinking about Thomas and I really think if we could somehow do a Virginia circuit for electric only, I know we got different mm-hmm. different folks that are fishing in different areas, different clubs, but if we could have like some regional type of competition and then have a end of year at whatever lake in Virginia, a one to, you know a crown an electric bass fishing only champion, um, and then maybe sponsor that person to fish in a you know atlantic region to go and represent the state i think that's something with that would would typically go over with a lot of the fishermen oh 100 um, and then if, if it gets big enough maybe if you win the regional they do a national but part of that if you win the regional, they sponsor your cost to go represent your region or give you some of the cost right um to go uh, represent your region um in a, like a national tournament so but yeah Norfolk area, your area, Richmond area. You, I mean, there's like so many little pockets yeah. of electric motor only lakes. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Part of me has been scratching my head going, how do I make that happen? I, my, I was thinking about reaching out to some of the clubs, but with my online tournaments, it's just, I don't have the time to do it right now. But I, I would, if someone was really serious about doing it, I would help sponsor it. You know, I'd push it on my channel. Matter of fact, I'd probably sponsor some, I'd probably bring in Omnia, my, my sponsor, to, do some of the the funding of the of the prizes. So we, we talked about electric uh, boats, and I think this is interesting because um, a, a kayak brand came out with a kayak that does look almost like a damn John boat, mm-hmm. and that thing had a firestorm. I think they got like a million views on my Facebook, and I, uh, a couple of prominent YouTubers said like, you know, I would it would be interesting when we see this evolution where you can have boating kayak tournaments because if it's just catchway release, why can't you do catchway release from a bass boat? And that's like an interesting idea. Um, like what, what is the blurred line that we're getting to where if we are, if we do do catchway release, there is no reason why you can't have the, this, this universal crossover match with kayaks, with electric motor only with big bass boats. You just got to pick the right lake. Honestly, that's all it comes down to. That I think you're, you hit, hit a spot on there, uh, Thomas. And, and one of the things, and, and not to, regress into this but one of the things with my tournaments that i do online that's really popular you can fish from the bank a kayak a boat a canoe i don't care what you're fishing you know and that really gravitates that's why i get a lot of people jump into the tournaments 
But if you found the right body of water, um, why can't you have kayaks with against boats and, and bass boats and electric boats? I don't think, I think a lot of people like that. And just, mm-hmm. just imagine if you're fishing in a paddling kayak and you win one of those tournaments, I mean, that, that, that's awesome. Right. Yeah. Um, that, now do you have, and really today when people are running around 15 and $20,000 kayak setups, do you have a, does a bass boat have an advantage? over a kayaker with all that electronics and everything on it i don't think so I really no because the only thing would be like if you're trying to like if you're on the tidal potomac and you want to make an sure. hour run but like again you just pick the lake and i think that would be the thing is you'd pick yeah. a body of water that they have to fish from um i think it'd be fascinating i would want to watch the results as, as just a, a spectator of the sport that would be fun to see who would actually win yeah absolutely you know that's that that might be an idea Thomas, one, that might be something to try next spring or next summer is doing all kayak, boat, bass mm-hmm. boat, whatever. I'll just throw out Lake Mooney, for an example. Yeah. That's a big enough lake that uh, has enough area for 40 or 50 different type of uh, boats to do and, and see what the results are. You know, that, that might be something to think about. And yeah, you know, I th- I th- he could come in down, down there and do a live cast on it. So yeah, I was gonna say I'll promote that because I would also like I'd honestly like to see one on the Potomac because there is so much drama that happens there. It would be fun to squinch that once and for all if a kayak beat out all those bass boats. Um, just for my yeah. <laughs> my heart, that would be hilarious. Uh, but yeah, no, that that, that is fascinating. Circling back around to like more of the fishing side of things, when we're dealing with these dog days of summers and you're dealing with these smaller lakes. Do you keep your presentation simple or are you just, are you hitting the bank or are you forward facing sonar doing the minnow thing? Cause it is deadly effective on so many lakes this time of year. Yeah, I, I, I mix it up. Um, I, so I just admit up front, I'm a power fisherman first, right? And that's the way I like to fish. Um, so when I fish, especially early morning, I'm hitting the bank and I'm top water fishing. There's always that five, six, seven pounder that, snuck up out of the deep water to get something so i usually always stop start on start on the top water if i'm fishing at night i'll hit the points uh before i get in you know late in the afternoon so that's my favorite way of fishing in the summer but truth be told i have to i have to downsize you know all the fish i caught um on wednesday or sunday afternoon i caught on a drop shot on a six inch robo worm in sexy shad color two foot leader so 10 pound test line and yeah, I, I do use, I do have live scope and I use it. Um, but what I found is the thing to find is not the fish. It's where the weed edge stops because the mm-hmm. fish are in the weeds, right? And you got to get them to come out. So um, you, I, I use that to find those weed edges and fish around the weed edges. If it's 17, 18 feet, whatever it is. Um, but that's, that's the game um, this time of year, especially in the real clear water. Um, I love the Kitech Easy Shiner. That's like my, favorite uh, uh me too favorite little bait um to fish the middle style with and believe it or not i haven't done as well this year as i have in the past so it's because a lot of people are fishing that way now um but you know i've, I've adjusted a little bit and i'll tell you one of my one of my favorite baits this time of year but for deep water fishing is the hair jig i mm-hmm. crush it on a hair jig especially when they're down there deep and they just i just rip it through that grass and um it they they hammer it um it's a it's a good effective bait as well in the summer but most of the time i'm slowing down and downsizing the bait this time of year when it gets tough it's i mean yeah the hair jig is so deadly because most people fish don't even see that thing and when you throw it around grass i, I think we're, we're also poo-pooing like grass and 18 feet of water people around here are not used to that that is a lake champlain a northern um a glacier lake type of deal like i saw that when i was fishing lake cayuga and lake chautauqua where the weeds would go into 20 feet and it doesn't make sense and you're just trying to now it's back when i had 2d sonar and you try to get the boat there and you're just flipping hoping to hit the edge um with that said that it gets that deep on the reverse is there matted vegetation is there like a frog bite up near shore yeah absolutely that's that's a good question there's no matted vegetation or just very very little It's all what I, what I grew up knowing is coontail moss, you know, the it's fluffy stuff. And it it's some places it'll come right up to the top. Hmm. And as the, as the lake drops, you know, it's dropping because it's summertime, you'll get a little matted vegetation around the very edge of the, at, at the bank. But, um, I haven't, I have thrown a frog for hours 
and for hmm. some reason they just don't they don't and I, i'll hear frogs in the afternoon in the morning on the bank and i'm not getting a bite on them and i try different types of frogs but when i throw that um that shower blows top water i'm sure you know what that one is from uh it's a really good top water bait and that shad color bam they're coming to get it so, so i think cool. it, it, it might be just the lake as well so no um, that, that, that's interesting yeah hmm. now i will tell you like abel lake it has a different type of vegetation and it's got the real steep banks it has those reeds it, you have to punch in there um to get to the fish you have to punch those reeds to get down to the fish when they're wow. in there. yeah so i do some punching uh, like you would in florida on abel lake what is the lake that you hate to fish like if there was a tournament on there you're like oh god because it doesn't fit your style i would say now lunga hmm. I, i've caught some big fish on there it's just I, 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 let me let me tell you why the predator fish it's so for every bass i catch i catch three pickle oh my god wow. it's overran with pickle remember it was closed for 15 years so not only did the bass grow the pickerel grow, <laughs> and uh, and that lake does have hickory shad in it. Um, it's got I've picked pulled big giant hickory shad out of out of uh, a pickerel's uh, mouth. So that's so cool. But um, yeah, that lake it's just uh, they're primarily because there's no there's not many features to the lake, and uh, it does get a lot of pressure now that it's open. Uh, it's on a on a Saturday. It's nothing to see, and it's only about five hundred acre lake. 35 boats on it, 40 boats, not wow. counting the rental. They had rental boats there too. Yeah. Really? That's yeah, you crazy. Can rent a boat for about, uh, I think it's 40 bucks for four hours with an electric motor on the back. How long do you think that'll last? I've always been curious about that because, um, again, so one thing on the channel is when I've talked about mooning before, people are like, you can't talk about that. It's going to get overrun. But then on the same token, you have Mots and Nye that no one fishes now. And so I feel like this goes in a rotation, a cycle where people mm -hmm. flood to it. Are you thinking these two lakes, like Mooney and Lunga and places like that, two more, three more years before people start moving to another lake? I think it's less than that, Thomas. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, the rumor cycle with social media, right, makes a difference, right? Yeah. You throw up a 10-pound bass caught on Lake X, whatever it is, whatever lake it is, people flock to that. I've noticed that. Um, and I even had people, and, and I'm and fine with people coming up and asking me where I catch fish and all that. I, I have a YouTube channel. You can watch it, right? It's no secret mm -hmm. to me. But I have people stop me on the lake at whatever lake, Mooney, Hunting Run, wherever, and ask me, where do I catch the big ones? I've seen you catch a big one here, right? And so, and it's just not me. I'm just not saying it's me. It's other, other things on social media, on Facebook and things people put their catches at. And I think when people see, you know, 10 large fish caught on one lake, they start to gravitate to that lake. Um, and they may come back to a, a lake later if they are not lucky, but I think it changes throughout the year. Um, and next year, Lake X will be more popular than Lake Z. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's a, the pow power of social media is real when it comes to fishing. I, it, I really believe it. It's fascinating to see, especially in your area, because it's one thing if it's like Lake Anna's hot, everyone goes like Anna. In your area, there's there's so many lakes, like six you could pick from, and people just bounce from one lake to another. Uh, and we and we completely like we didn't even touch on the Rappahannock River, which I'm assuming is that one of the rivers that you want to try to get a little bit more uh, time on. Yeah, I want to get some time on the Rappahannock. I love smallmouth fishing and wraps uh, known in this area for some good smallmouth fishing. Um, I do want to go to the Shenandoah too. That's mm. not a bad bad uh, ride from my house so i want to just i want to try that out and i really watching some of your guys on this that you had on the on your channel i might commit to like a weekend on the james yeah, yeah. i i think i and i've fished the james river growing up i grew up in a different part of virginia down in the lexington area and i fished the maury river the james river and all that for smallmouth fishing and just crushed it um but i, I think i want to I, I'd love to get back on the James because it's a good fishery. It really is. The the brown fish are really addicting. It's so hard it when I have friends. They're like, "Oh, we're catching twenty pounds extra green ones," and I drop a twenty two inch smallmouth, and it's like these things are just so much more fun, dude. <laughs> <They are. laughs> uh, yeah. And I seen you caught a nice one the other day in a tournament. That was a, that was a nice. That was a nice I was smallmouth. shaking. Um, it's apparently a Maryland citation, and it was 
it was the biggest smallmouth I caught in Maryland. It was every bit of five pounds. Uh, and that was summertime body. If it was pre-spawn, it would have been over six. It was, oh, yeah. Easy. I, I've never caught one that I didn't think they were that big on the river. And yeah, yeah dude, they're just the way they jump and everything. It's, it's, it's a resource that Virginia has. We don't talk about, we have so many smallmouth streams, an ungodly amount of smallmouth streams that people can hit and they're untapped. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, there's areas in the state that it's hard to get to some of these uh, fishing areas on rivers and they're just loaded um, with, with nice smallmouth. I remember hiking, you know, a couple of miles into the mountains when I lived, I lived in the George Washington national forest oh, cool. and there's a little river called South river and it's great for trout fishing, but man, the smallies it's no one goes there for smallmouth fishing. And I would catch, I don't, I go, I go in there and catch 50 smallmouth in a day. Some, you know, so some nice ones in the two and three, four pound range, but it just, it was unbelievable the amount of smallmouth that were there. So that's so cool, dude. Sh yeah. Shane, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Just giving us a little glimpse behind the curtain of the Fredericksburg area. Guys, if you got to go check it out, it's a really cool area of Virginia. Uh, and then if you want to fish a tournament, I mean, you know, Shane Flynn Outdoors, there'll be a link in the episode description, all that. Do you have anything coming up tournament wise or just channel wise that you'd like to promote? Yeah. So for tournaments, we do have two more tournaments left this year. We have our smallmouth only speaking of speaking of the brownfish. Uh, I'm hosting a smallmouth only nationwide tournament that starts the 19th of August. If you're interested in that and the format for that tournament, it's just your three largest bass. And we, we, we call it the, the small mouth smash. We take your three last largest bass, we smash them together. And, and the, the results of that length wins the tournament. Um, and I get a pretty good turnout for it. If you're interested in just a small mouth only it's free. Uh, all my tournaments are absolutely free. Um, and then the last tournament of the year is our team tournament. And the team tournament format is your teammate can be anywhere in the United States. You can be in Virginia and your teammate can be in California. You have to coordinate your catches. Um, it's a two-phase tournament. You have to catch all your fish at least a minimum of one inch apart in the first period. And then in the second period, you have to start your fish out one inch uh, bigger than your largest fish from the first period. And then the second bass has to be one inch larger than that, at least one inch larger. It makes it really competitive. It's a competitive format. We do. That's our summer, it's a big summer tournament going on right now, that format. So it kind of equals the playing field across the United States. If you're down in Florida and you're going to put a, and it, this happens every tournament, someone will put a 19, 20 and a 21 in the first round and they can't catch a 22 and a 23, or they'll go, go up to 22 and they can't catch a 23 and a 24. 24 inch bass is hard to catch. I don't care what part of the United States you're in. What is the biggest bass you've seen in your tournaments recorded? Uh, I just had one that was recorded lengthwise, 24 and a half inches long in Georgia. Holy crap. Nine pounds of ounces. I was going to say like, good. Damn. That's a long fish. Good Lord. Yeah. yeah. So th there's some, <laughs> you know, we just have a big bass tournament that starts off our spring. And I had a 24 inch again in Georgia. It wasn't in Florida. Uh, Georgia won it this year. So mm. get, get a lot of nice fish, but if you're interested yeah. in those tournaments, all you have to do is email me at shameful outdoors at yahoo.com and we'll get you registered. Guys, go check it out. It's a really cool format. It's really the wave of the future. And especially if you don't, this is something else. It, when I was a kid, there were very few terms you could do from the bank. You had to become a co-anchor join a bass club. This is a really cool opportunity as a gateway drug to get into tournament fishing. So please go check out his channel, get more information where you and your kid could just be fishing and why not be entered in a tournament? All you need is a bump board and a couple of other things and you're good to go. Go check that out. Link in the episode description down below. And if you like to guys, go check us out on Spotify and Apple podcast review really helps us push us in the algorithm. We fluctuate between like 150 and the top hundred uh, fishing podcasts in the nation. I'd like to kind of beat Iconelli is kind of my goal for 2020 and get above him. Let's hopefully that that'll happen. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.